Hi, this is Tony from Beefheart Project Toronto. We have a treat for you today. We're going to show you how to learn Dr. Dark, how to teach it to your band and how to play it yourselves. First, we're going to have a word about Trout Mask Replica because that will lead us to where we are going to be here today. Now, a lot of people argue about how that album happened, why it happened, what made it happen. There's no question for me that Don Van Vliet wrote the music that's on that record. There's no argument from John French, Drumbo, or Zoot Horn Rolo in their books. They're very honest about the contributions they did make, and they were very, very important to both records. But Don wrote the basic music, and he wrote the basic drum parts as well. How did he do that? There's lots of ways to direct a musician. You can whistle, you can sing, you can dance around, you can clap your hands, you can tell them what you want in many different ways. Don would pound things out on a piano. He was a terrible guitarist, I'm sure, I am, and, but he could pluck out a few notes for them. He could play his part on a harmonica, if that's what he wrote it on. So he was able to give the music to these guys. For Trout Mask Replica, it was a whole different process. He had a piano and he would sit and bang out these riffs into a tape recorder, which John French didn't like dealing with. John preferred to sit with him and just uh, notate the stuff, learn the riff from him, write it down, then Dom would go on to his next riff. Now, where did this music come from? A lot of people think that Don was some sort of, um, suddenly became some kind of musical retard in, uh, in 1969 and didn't write all this stuff himself and his band members had to do it for him. But I would like to remind everybody that he had already made a couple of albums. He had been playing, he had toured Europe and Britain, was very popular in those places. And he had real bands, and he'd written lots of songs. On Strictly Personal, the album preceding Trout Mask, uh, Don was really involved in the arrangements. According to John French, Don was very involved in every note and all the parts and how the whole thing was put together. He's not coming from nowhere to make Trout Mask Replica. In my opinion, it's a very simple recipe what caused Don to go into this experimental place. He became obsessed with Ornette Coleman in the late 60s. He talked about him constantly in interviews. He loved the guy. And if you study Ornette's music, you'll find that uh, at times he can be a, certainly can be a traditional jazz man. But at other times, he almost invented jazz rock because there'll be these powerful, powerful drums happening under his, under his performance. And also, he could write so much discord, it was shocking. He, he wrote whole half-hour pieces, symphonies for orchestras, where it's just this blaze of, of noise and discord for the whole thing. So Don would have been very impressed by this. Ornette was really varied in his abilities to create music, and he also was very comfortable going into that outer space place where nothing makes any sense, and Don loved that. In Ornette's best music, you don't know where you are. He's just taking you off somewhere, and you can't find one, two, three, four, anywhere. You just don't know where you are. So Don wanted to make his music do that. The recipe is fairly simple, like I said. Not so easy to cook, but very easy to write down. And so Don, previously a composer of blues riffs, continued to uh, compose blues riffs, but he got himself a piano, which he never played before. And he sat and plunked out these amazing little riffs, and John French would notate them and then show them to the band. Don would just keep pumping out these riffs and go, here, that's for the guitar, that's for the bass, that's for the guitar, here, th let's work on your drum part. And Don would just piece together all these things and he'd hand everything to these guys and then it would be up to them to assemble it and learn how to play it. Then Don would go and hear what they're doing. According to Antennae Jimmy Siemens, Don would, uh, quote, Don didn't have a clue. He, he just didn't know where he was. He'd come and he'd be dazzled by the music and amazed by it. Now, of course, if you're doing an experiment in the dark where he's just writing all these riffs out and just handing them to people and going and saying, here, go learn these, and then he waits till they've learned them and he goes in to decide what his next step is. He is going to be bewildered by this because the, the experiment's coming out even better than he thought. It's weirder than he thought, but he also doesn't know where he's going to sing. It's all discord. He is intentionally creating riffs now that are in different tunes. The riffs themselves are in tune with themselves, but they're not in tune with each other necessarily. So you could have something playing in E flat on this guitar and something playing in E on this guitar at the same time. You have automatic discord, and there's no way to put a melody to that. He does that all the time. He also has riffs that are five beats long, or seven, or eight, or ten, or eleven, or fourteen beats long, where another riff that's playing alongside it is five beats long. And they just keep repeating, and each time you repeat, you're playing with something different. There's no repetition like you find in rock music or standard folk musics. And that's what Don wanted. So he was creating this sort of music that would keep turning into itself and, and rolling 
without ever having that one, two, three, four feeling anymore. There's a pulse through the music, but it doesn't lock to a steady time signature. Dom would then go in and hear them at rehearsal and go, oh, it sounds great, wow, I love it. How am I gonna sing to this? Makes sense that he wanted no headphones in the studio for that. Everybody else thinks that's weird, but to me it makes sense because when you hear a bunch of stuff that's discordant, you can't just sing a regular melody to it. It's not gonna work. It's not gonna make any sense. Or you're gonna get so distracted from by the music that you're not gonna be able to put down what you were thinking in your head. That's what he wanted to do. Just turn the music off, let me just sing my parts. Let it come through the walls so I can hear when it stops. The progression then, from there to Deckles, came from Don noting that there were better and, and lesser tracks on Trout Mask. For instance, he didn't really go for Big jo when Big Jones sets up again. It's one riff, it's a jam. It's, it's like kindergarten beef heart. Ella Guru, on the other hand, is university beef heart. It is beautifully tuned. It's organized. Parts repeat over different parts beautifully, seamlessly. It's so organized and beautiful, and it's tuned. You can sing in tune. For Deckles, Don went total abstractions of, for instance, Neon Meat Dream of an Octafish. There's a bit of that happening in Deckles. And then there's a lot of Ella happening in Deckles, where it's very tuned and he can sing along. His vocals on Deckles are beautiful. So in order to break down a Beefheart song and figure it out, you have to create a grid. Because our band didn't have the benefit of two years of practicing together eight hours a day and living in the same house together and creating the kind of rapport and understanding that those guys had, we had to compensate in other ways. We had to uh, work very hard at just one song at a time and learn it. And we sometimes used a click track in the studio, which is a metronome for non-musicians. It's just something you set to a time and it clicks at that time forever till you turn it off or until uh, if you wound it up till it unwinds so we had to use a click track for a few songs to keep ourselves in time with the grid that we laid out for the music to be on how do you create a grid for trope mask and lick my decals off the grid is based on john french's drumbo's drum part the reason is because he's so mathematical that he lays everything out beat for beat so that you once you learn all of john's parts and lay them out in a row you can actually count the number of beats in the song he will account for every single beat and he creates a grid that then you have to drop all the other instruments into the slots the reason that i have the confidence to show you dr dark is because i was able to obtain uh, tapes of the separate instruments playing by themselves from the actual final recording. Even though that gave us all the parts, the notes and the beats, we could learn exactly the way they'd been played, it still didn't show us how they fit together because some of the timing in the song is so strange and there are two or three musical mysteries that are truly mind boggling. So we're going to uncover all of that, unravel it for you in this video. And at the end of it, we hope you will all go and teach your bands how to play Dr. Dark and we want you to send us your versions, okay? Now we'll start. Now when you take John French's part and lay it all out in a line, as we said, it's a grid. So we're gonna go into now John French's parts bit by bit. To begin with, the way I've had to write it out is going to be appalling and outrageous to traditionalists. Here's what our chart looks like. <laughs> Now here's what a typical orchestra leader's lead sheet looks like. The orchestra leader, when he's conducting, has everyone's parts in front of him. And you can see how on that lead sheet, they have the same bar lines. The bar lines all line up. Now on our chart, you'll notice that they don't. There's only about four places in the entire song where everybody's bar line lines up. That's why I needed to write it out this way. So you're gonna see at the beginning of Drumbo's part, which is at the top of the chart. It's the first part we're going to go through, riff by riff. The very first bar is one beat long. This is an outrage, but it's necessary because Drumbo's first riff is actually five beats long. And he needs one beat as a lead-in beat because he goes, ba-da. And so you need that beat beforehand. So there's a ba-da. That one beat is separate from his riff though. His riff is five beats long and you'll see that there are three of those bars. So I had to put one bar of one at the beginning of the, the whole part. So his first riff is five beats long and it goes like this. One, two, three, four, five. Ba da 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 bam, ba da bam, ba da 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 bam, ba da bam. Okay. 
the second uh, riff in Drumbo's part is in nine beats. Sounds like this. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. Bum bum ba bum bum ba bum bum ba bum 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 ba bum bum ba bum bum ba bum bum bum. Plays three times. And then his next riff, it's a seven beat phrase instead of nine beats, but it's essentially the same riff that we just heard. It goes like this one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Bum, bum, ba bum, bum, ba bum, bum, ba bum. So this next riff is four beats long, and he plays ten of them. And this goes one, two, three, four. Bu ba ba doodly ah, bu da ba doodly ah, bu da ba doodly ah. There is a modification. Every third bar, it goes bu da ba do ba, bu da ba do ba. Okay, so it's two of one, and then the third one is the modification. It goes two, and then a third one, then two, and a third one, then two, and a third one, and then one. Bu ba ba do li ah, bu ba ba do li ah, bu ba ba do ba. At the end of that section of Drumbo's uh, part, we have one of the only bar lines in the entire song that actually runs through everybody's part. This is the beginning of the music where the singing starts. Mama, mama, here come Dr. Dark. So his riff there is uh, an eight beat riff and it goes four times. Bum, 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 ba -dum -ba -dum -ba -dum -boom -boom. bum, 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 ba -dum -ba -dum -ba -dum -boom -boom. Four of those. Drumbo's next riff, after the singing has begun and we're into the song, goes like this, and it's in four. One, two, three, four. <laughs> then we go into this mysterious part. We're going to have a more involved explanation of this later but right now we're just going to show you what uh, drumbo's part is this is in three it is one repeating part that goes for 17 bars it sounds like this one two three one two three tick a diddle did it 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 When we come out of that 17, there's one beat. Then we go into a section that's in five. Now I just wanna point out that one beat to you. This is one of the secrets of the song. There's a beat right there before we go into this next section. And at the end of this next section, there's another single beat. That is your indication because there's no other reason for John French Drumbo to put those two beats in at the beginning and the end of this section, except as placeholders because he has created a mathematical grid that is counted beat for beat from the beginning to the end of the song. By doing this, John Drumbo shows us, guarantees us that the entire song is mathematically laid out to a grid. This guarantees us that everybody else's part is also to a grid. Otherwise, he wouldn't have needed to put in those beats just to show the converse. If those beats weren't in there and this was done the opposite way, this would be one of those situations where Musicians have to look at each other and go, okay, we're going to change, we're going to change now. And they're, they've got to all be together and watching each other to do that change. That is not the case in this music, though. These guys can play this with their backs to each other. They could be in different rooms with headphones on, not even seeing each other, and this part will be the same because they are orchestrated. By showing us that beat and at the, at the beginning and the end of this five section, John has guaranteed us that. That's how you can be sure that you're working on a grid. And just one more note before we get back into this. The beauty of this kind of writing for drums is that it's a pattern. They're all patterns that you can play on uh, with your fingers. You can tap out on a, on a table or you can hit your, your thighs or you can sing it. You know, And then you can apply them to any drums you want. You could have 
bongos and congas and djembes set up or you could have a bunch of little things that you hit, miniature drums, whatever you want. It's the pattern that's important. Okay, now we're back to the song. After that beat, we go into a section that is quite remarkable and it's got another one of the mysteries. There are two musical mysteries in this song that are mind boggling, but we will get to them when we get to the bass and piano parts. What John plays in this part is a piece, uh, a riff that's in five beats. Drumbo's next riff is six beats long, and it sounds like this. When we come out of that six part, there are five stray beats here that John had to deal with. That's all I can figure from them. What he plays is not very specific, so we had to come up with our own version of it based on what he plays. All I know is there were five beats there that he had to do something with. And here's how we dealt with it. We made it one, two, three, four, five, boom, boom, ba. So that last odd bar of five that John had to deal with leads us into the end of the song. But everybody is still jumbled. The bar lines are not together yet. We haven't reached the actual end. His next riff is in eight beats, plays six times, but then there's a seventh one that is in seven beats. It's exactly the same riff, but the seventh one just drops off the very last beat. Sounds like this. Okay, so that dropped beat at the end of that last bar is, is almost imperceptible. It's very difficult to catch that because the next beat, he goes straight into this end. Drumbo does a build with Ed Marimba into this final repeating section. So this build goes one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, boom, ba, do, da, do, ka, diddle, da, boom, ba, do, da, do, ka, diddle, da. Now we have the end of the song. It's a repeating section, and this riff is in four, and it really is very simple. Drumbo's job is just to keep the four beat happening. Our version goes We are answering a question that Samuel Andreev asked in his Frownland analysis and also in his interviews with all of the musicians that played on Trout Mask. And that question is, how did you guys learn this stuff? How did you play it? Because as an academic, Samuel and, and other people in, in his position would not be able to understand how such discordant and complex music could be played by a bunch of musicians without having sheet music in front of them, without being organized in some traditional way. But as our chart shows you, you can't organize this music in any traditional way. And as we've also shown you now, this music is a series of riffs set to a number line, a count. And as long as you play your riffs in the right order and in the right places, the song works. Drumbo's entire part is 13 riffs. That's what he had to learn to learn Dr. Dark. He had to learn 13 riffs, and there are a couple little elbows and joining bits in the song but that's the whole part for him. Now we'll go on to Ed Marimba's part, which complements Drumbo. And at the end of it, you're going to hear the two of them play the entire song together, just the drums. His bar lines and the number of beats in his bars are essentially the same as Drumbo's through the whole thing. They're very much locked together. But there are two points in the song where Ed Marimba does break away and plays specifically with the guitar. Now, at the beginning of the chart, once again, we have that 
first bar of just one beat and that's to let Drumbo have that beat so that he can lead into his first riff. Ed Marimba plays nothing on that beat. He doesn't have a lead in. He starts playing when Drumbo starts playing his riff in five. So we can just forget about that first beat or leave it out. The riff that's in five beats sounds like this. One, two, three, four, five. Brr, brr, tsh, brr, brr, tsh, brr, brr, tsh. Brr, brr, tsh. Ed Marimba's second riff is played entirely on the hi-hats and it's it's more of an effect than anything. It's very interesting because it's like the baby and the mommy and the daddy. He's playing a buzz on the on the hats, so it's just this constant shh, and he opens it a little, then a little more, then a little more. So you get this and it sounds, the effect is more like a man-eating plant kind of reaching out of some plants to grab at you. It's very spooky. And that is played to the three bars of nine and the one bar of seven that Drumbo plays. Ed Marimba's third riff comes with Drumbo's riff that goes that is a four beat riff that plays 10 times and Ed Marimba's part is going Now we come to the section where the voice comes in singing Mama Mama, Here Come Dr. Dark and this is a section that's eight beats long and it's played four times. Ed Marimba is actually just building little climaxes on his snare. So you'll hear uh, Drumbo going do do da ba do 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 and Ed Marimba's snare is going brr, brr, and, and building up each of those. <laughs> This is the Demented Circus section. Ed Marimba's part is a riff in four beats. It goes eight times and it goes Now we come into one of the most mysterious parts of the song, as I mentioned earlier, and we will explain it better later. This part's in three. The riff is three beats long. And while Drumbo's going tick a tick a did it, tick a tick a did it, tick a tick a did it, the drums are playing just the hi hat buzz, the little rolls, and they play with the guitar parts. So while the guitar is playing its little part, these rolls are happening underneath. <laughs> Now, here's one of the mystery parts, and we already went into an explanation of this. At the end of those 17 bars of three, there is that single beat on the snares. After that beat, we go into the section that has uh, a riff written in five beats. Now, I've taken a liberty here with the music. The part that I've given Gord, our drummer, to play in place of Ed Marimba's bit there is based entirely on Drumbo's part and it bolsters the five beats. It actually makes it much more powerful because I felt the five was too subtle. So they're both playing it, but our, our drummer Gord is playing those beats on different drums. So that's what bolsters the five. As an overdub, we still had him play Ed Marimba's three cymbals that he plays through this section. This is the section of a riff that's in five beats, and there are 13 of them. And at the end of it, there's going to be that snare again. to the part that Drumbo plays in six. And Ed Marimba just plays a, a shuffle 
on the edges of, uh, on the rim of his drum going to do 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 Now we come to the very odd five beats that Drumbo had to deal with, and we've already played you how we play it. At the very beginning of that is when the famous guitar part comes in. That part. This is where Ed Maremba breaks away from Drumbo's part, and he plays specifically along with that guitar part on the hi-hat. This section is an alternating um, riff of seven beats, then eight beats. Seven, then eight, seven, then eight, and it runs four times. So after we come out of that guitar part that the hats have been playing along with, we have something very similar to an early part of the song where Ed Marimba is playing these climactic buzzes on the snare. So that it's just brr, 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 brr. He's building you up to the final climax, which is the repeat at the end. This section is written in riffs that are eight beats long and played four times. So along with Drumbo's part that goes... <laughs> During each of those, Ed Marimba is playing his building snares that help us to build up to the climax. And from that build, we go into the final riff. Now, Drumbo is playing in four. He's going... But Ed Marimba is playing in five at the same time. He plays two cymbals and then three toms, and it goes Now we'll play for you both drummers playing their entire series of riffs with the click track, the metronome, playing over top so you can see how the grid works. And then we'll go to the bass and guitar parts.
The first three bass patterns, riffs in uh, Dr. Dark, are all in seven. They're each seven beats. And the first one is played twice, second one is played twice, third one is played three times. I'm going to play all three for you. They're all different versions of the same thing. So here's the first one. Uh, it's in seven, and they, they all start on the second beat. Two, three, four, five, six, seven, one. <laughs> Second one. Third one. The fourth riff is in ten beats and it's played three times. This is it. That fourth riff ended on these notes, an E and a B flat, and the next part resolves beautifully from there. This is where the vocal comes in, mama mama here come Dr. Dark, and the bass part is Sixth riff is the crazy circus part, and uh, the bass is nice and simple on the bottom. Now we go into the uh, one of the mysterious parts of the song. This is where the drums are playing in three underneath. And the guitar and bass <clears throat> play the same set of musical figures, there's 16 of them, except the drums play 17 bars of three, and the guitar and bass stretch the 16 bars of three across 17 bars. We'll get to how they did that in a moment, but here's the bass part that he's playing, and if you were playing it in a standard waltz time, it would sound like this. One, two, three, one, two, three. <laughs> Now the eighth and ninth riff of the bass part are two different versions of the same thing. Not only that, but the eighth one plays twice over nine beats, and then it plays twice over eight beats. This is the riff. <laughs> Then the next two are identical, but there's just fewer beats underneath, so they have to be a little closer. Then there's a modification of that, which stays in eight beats, and there's four of them. Tenth riff of the bass is a sort of a jolly bit. It's in six beats, six beats long, this riff, and it sounds like this. The 
the 11th riff of the bass uh, remains in six, always starts on the second beat of the six beats, and the first riff repeats three times, and then the second riff resolves it. One, two, three, four, five, six, one, two. So now we come into the surprise section where Mama Mama Here Come Dr. Dark comes back in. It's one of those rare moments in the song where there's one bar line that runs down through everyone's parts and everyone locks together here. Uh, and it's a big explosion. And the bass has two riffs. The first one is... The second one is... bass riff of the song which goes into the fade out uh, the first version of it just leaves out a few notes and from there on is complete and plays the whole fade out
One of the nicest things about the guitar part is that all of its bars are in seven for the whole intro section. Uh, so we're playing uh, according to the original, the way Zoot played it. I know that later everybody did... But we have played respectfully Zoot's version, the one that he directed from Lick My Deckles Off Baby, and so we've adhered to, to his performance of it. The first riff for the guitar, uh, there's three different versions of it. The entire intro section for the guitar is all in seven. All of his riffs are in seven beats each, so it's nice steady seven all the way through. And the first, second, and third riff are all different versions of the same thing, once again. So the first riff plays three times, second riff plays four times, third riff plays four times, fourth riff plays twice. So I'm going to play those all for you right now. That's the first one. That's the second one. Third one is... fourth one is here's the guitar playing it Now we go into the uh, part where the vocal comes in. Mama, mama, here come Dr. Dark. Everybody plays together. This is one of the few points in the song where the bar lines are right down through everybody's part and they all join. This is the guitar riff for that section. His next riff is four beats. He plays uh, four of them. Sounds like this. Now we go into the floaty part. Everybody's playing in three on the bottom, but the guitar is floating around on the top playing this. question before was, how do you turn 16 bars of 3 into 17 bars? Since the drums are actually playing 17 bars, <clears throat> but the guitar and bass only have 16 bars of music written for them. If you count them like this, 1, 2, 3, 2, 2, 3, 3, 2, 3, 4, 2, 3, you end up with 16. The trick that Zoot obviously came up with, because no one else seemed to remember it, is that the first three are played on, uh, or the first six really, are played on the downbeats. One, two, three, one, two, three. And then the second set are played on the upbeats. One and two and three and one and two and three and one, two, three, one, two, three, one, two and three and one and two and three and one and two, three, one, two, three, one, two, three and one and two and three and one and two and, and so forth. By doing that, it ends up coming out right perfectly at the end of the 17 bars of drums, and they never quite lock. Okay, this is an aside, a little uh, detailed explanation of the section that we've just gone through. Um, I gave a, a general explanation, but it was not complete, and if you want to be able to play this song and play this section properly, this is how you have to do it. So I've drawn you a map here. This line is a number line, and 
these little lines coming down from it are the clicks or the beats of the song. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, and so on. This section is in three-quarter time, so it's divided into bars of three. And this is the drum part up along the top. I've tried to make this in, in, in a way that non-musicians can understand. So the drum plays 17 bars of these three beats. One, two, three, two, two, three, three, two, three, four, two, three. And his part is actually He plays 17 of those, and at the end of them, there's that one big snare beat that both our drummers play that I've told you about already. And that's his part. So you get your drummer going I'm telling him to play 17 of those all the way through and pay no attention to what everybody else is doing. And at the end of it, he plays one beat, bang, on the snare. Now, at the same time, underneath that, or on top of it, you have the guitar and bass playing 16 bars of three. And uh, the guitar part, you don't need to worry about the bass part. He plays in unison with the guitar. So as long as he's riding the guitar, he's fine. You need to worry about this guitar part to make this work. Ding. Now his section is also in three, or, or his part is also in three, and he plays 16 of them. So I'll show you the bars. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, thirteen, fourteen, fifteen, and sixteen. And they sound like ding, 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 ding. Uh, each of those little... Uh, Sets of three is one bar, and he plays 16 of those. Now, how do we make 16 bars of guitar fit onto 17 bars of drums and have the last note of the guitar come out after that 17th bar of the drums on that big snare beat? Here's how. The first two bars that the guitar plays, he comes in on the one beat of each of those bars of three. So there's a one, two, three, two, two, three. For these two bars, he goes, one, two, three, one, two, three. Both of them start on the one beat. The next two of his uh, uh, sets of three start on the one and a half beat. So it's one and two and three and one and two and three and. Now, the third set of his uh, beats, uh, really, one, two, three, four, fifth set. But if you, if you look at his musical part of ding, 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 that happens a certain number of times in the song. But each of those is a bar three. So you've got ding, 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 two, two, three, one and two and three and one and two and three and. Now with this set, you start on two. One, two, three, one, two, three, one. The set after that begins on the two and a half. One, two, and three, and one, and two, and three, and one, and... The next set starts on three. Two, three, one, two, three, one, two... And the next set starts, of course, on the three and a half. Two, three, and one, and two, and three, and one, and two, and... Now, here's the magic part. We've done a full circle. We're back at the first beat of the bar, once again, right where we started back here. The first two bars, you recall... We're on the first beat. Then we were on the one and a half beat, then the two beat, then the two and a half beat, then the three beat, then the three and a half beat. We've come full circle and we're now back on the first beat of the bar. But we've still got one, two, three, four bars of this to play. Here's how we come out at the right beat. For this uh, last four bars, the first two, like the first two of the whole section, the first two start on the one beat. So it's one, do, do, dun, do, do. And then we do the same thing we did before. It goes to the one and, one and, two and, three and. But this time it's abbreviated. Instead of two of them, there's just one. One and, two and, three and. Now the last section, or the next section back here was, of course, starting on the two beat. And there was two of those, but we're abbreviated here. There's just one of them, and we move up to the two beat again. So this last four bars plays two on the one beat, one on the one and a half beat, and the last one on the second beat, 
which ends it on the beat after the whole section with the snares. Here's how it sounds if I sing it to you. One, do, 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 one, and two, and three, and one, and two, and three, and one, two, three, one, two, three, one, two, and three, and one, and two, and three, and one, and two, three, one, two, three, one, two, three, and one, and two, and three, and one, and two, and three. One, two, three, one, two, three, one, and two, and three, and one, two, three, one. That's the end of the song, or the, the section, excuse me. Uh, 13 seconds of music. Even the band doesn't remember playing it. Uh, Don's later band didn't play this, and uh, John French's later magic band didn't play this section. They cut it down to 16 beats to match the guitar, and then, then you have a waltz. So everybody, everybody plays one... One, two, three, one, two, three, one, two, three, one, two, three. And both bands, Don's later band and John French's magic band, played the part that way as though there were just 16 bars. So they seems to have forgotten that there was a 17th bar of drums and that there was a magic ending to it. There's your explanation. If you play it this way, you'll be playing it like the original record. Back to our story. So this is the eighth riff for the guitar. This goes over the bass part that goes. The bass plays a couple of variations of that, but that's its basic part. It plays it eight times. The first two are over nine beats each, and the rest of them are over eight beats each. That's the same for the guitar. So the guitar riff doesn't change at all, it just plays eight times through, it sounds like this. does a lead in at the end of the last bar that's gone and then that's the ninth riff of the guitar And then there's a nice piece of trickery where that da -da -da, which is again the end of the last bar leads into this new section which is another piece of magic. These bars are written seven beats, then eight, then seven, then eight. The first two beats are always and then the seven goes And then this, the uh, second one goes in eight beats. The whole thing sounds like this. And it's seven and then eight, seven beats, then eight beats. <laughs> Back to the uh, beginning of the song or the beginning of the vocal part of the song. Mama, Mama, here comes Dr. Dark comes back in. Nice surprise. Everybody's playing again together. Again, one of the few times in the whole song where one bar line runs right through everybody's parts and they all come together for this. Now, in the original part or the earlier part that uh, the guitar played, it sounded like this. <laughs> But 
But this one is a little bit different. Now we come into what is probably the most complex guitar part of the entire song, the final riff, which just plays right through the whole fade out. I'm going to play it in slow motion first. And he's got to play it this fast. fades out and that is the entire guitar part for Dr. Dark. <laughs> So there are all the parts for Dr. Dark. Like I said, I had the confidence to show you these because I did have individual performances by all the band from the actual recording that we all bought. And that gave us all of the parts in the beats so we could learn them exactly as they were played. But the real secrets that we've shared with you here in this film are the way all of it sits together, the grid. This method will work for all of Trout Mask Replica's music and all of uh, Lick My Decals Off music. You can apply this method to the later music of uh, Dock at the Radar Station and Ice Cream for Crow, but there's a different compositional method used for those albums. We will get into that at another time if there's interest for it. 
But for now, really you're safest if you can figure out John French Drumbo's part and then create a grid out of it and lay everything on top of it. We would love to see anybody use this tutorial to create their own version of Dr. Dark. We'd love to hear it. But I want to say right now, if you use a computer to do it, you're disqualified immediately because we've done all the work for you. And if you just feed it into a computer and tell it to play everything that I've told you, you haven't done anything at all. So I would love to hear different versions of Dr. Dark based on our tutorial. Our first film was a piece of art that we designed to go with Hair Pie Big 2. And our third film is going to be the first proper review and analysis of Lick My Deckles Off Baby, the album. And I really do hope that some of you will go out and try and learn this song. This is Beefheart Project Toronto, over and out. Have a great day.